I used to see him around town. Actually, everybody did. Small coal mining community. Seemed like everybody had a story about him. Everybody had a theory. I was digging around a, a tree stump. We'd bought a house and just moved in a few days before, and, and, and I was digging around an old tree stump. You know, I bet I've told this story a hundred times. And every time I tell it, I remember something different about him. I started digging. I had my coveralls on, barefoot. It was a beautiful, warm summer day. My wife and girls had gone uptown, and, and I was kneeling around that tree stump. I was digging, and I wondered who lived around me. As I dug around that tree stump, I noticed an old house that really caught my attention. Large bushes had grown up around it. It seemed like it was abandoned. The front porch had sagged down on it. The windows were filthy. And I remember thinking, you know, somebody ought to really tear that old house down. And so as I dug around and looked around a few more moments, all of a sudden I saw someone come out of that house, that old abandoned looking, we called him haunted when we were children, house. And I couldn't believe my eyes. He'd come out the back door, but enough to one side of the house I could see him. And I recognized who it was. It was old Norman. I thought, God... How could you have me buy a house across the street from old weird Norman? Well, I don't mean to be unkind, Lord, but he acts strange. You know how he is. He walks up and down our main street uh, twice as fast as most folks while rubber galoshes flop on his feet instead of shoes. And he wears old overalls that are filthy and old hats. You can't tell the design, the original design. It's so grease and oil soaked. And he's got whiskers and big thick glasses that make his eyeballs look too large. And he acts strange on our main street in our little town. He walks up and down and all of a sudden he'll stop and look off into space. And he begins to talk to somebody or something. Hey, 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 like that. And then he'll turn around and walk two blocks this way and stop and go. Hey, hey, hey. And you had me, God, buy a house across the street from weird Norman. How strange is he? Sometimes i got to be gone. I work in the mines and... And would Norman come across and harm my family while I'm gone? Is he weird? I'd heard rumors about him around our town. While I was in the barber shop one day, the conversation somehow turned to Norman. Somebody said, you know, Norman, that everybody sees around town all the time. I know what made him that way. Someone said, what? And he, this fellow said, I heard it. he got hit by a Greyhound bus, and that's what made him like that. Another fellow said, I don't even think that's the right story. He said, I, I, think, I think Norman was one of them there geniuses. And one day he got so brilliant, his mind just exploded. <laughs> and I didn't know how weird he was, but as I worked around that tree stump, I wondered, and then, and then all of a sudden, he saw me. And he did something I couldn't believe. He raised his arms like the Incredible Hulk. And he screamed at me. And he ran down the side of his house with his arms like that, screaming at me. Ah, here he come. And he stopped over on his side of the street near his sidewalk, thank God, and turned and went back to his lawnmower. Well, needless to say, by this time he had my attention. And I remember thinking, God, I know we're supposed to love everybody, but if he comes over here, I'm going to defend myself. I looked and here he come again. Ah! He did it three times in all, each time stopping at his side of the street, staring at me and turning and going back to his lawnmower. And then something happened to me that I really didn't expect. I don't know if you had this happen to you, but it's difficult to explain. Suddenly a boldness came to me that I normally wouldn't have possessed. And I believe faith began to operate in me that I normally wouldn't have had. And I got up from where I was digging around the tree stump, walked right across the street, into Norman's yard, right up close to him, looked at him. I'd never been that close to him. He was angry. His old lawnmower, he'd been trying to get it to run and he couldn't get it to work. And, and he was mad. He was frustrated and he's very nervous. And he looked at me and, and, and I said, are you having trouble with your lawnmower here, Norman? And he looked at me with those huge eyes and he said, Are you having trouble with your lawnmower, Norman? I thought I just said that. 
I said, well, Norman, I'm not much of a lawnmower mechanic, but let me see what I can do here. I heard him say as I started to tighten a screw and clean the spark plug, I'm not much of a lawnmower mechanic, Norman. Let me see what I can do here. <laughs> and I really don't know a lot about a lawnmower, but I prayed, cleaned the spark plug and pulled the rope and it ran beautifully like it had been to the repair shop. It just sat there and purred. And, and, and he looked at the lawnmower and he looked at me, looked at my house, looked at me, looked at the lawnmower. He looked at me. I didn't know what he was going to do. I was watching him closely and all of a sudden he backed up two or three feet and he went. <laughs> and I saw a green and yellow tooth there and a green and yellow tooth there and two down here. And for just a part of an instant, no more than that, as I went back across the street, I thought, I wonder if anybody ever told Norman about Jesus. Oh, surely they have in our little bitty town with all the Christians we have. And so I forgot about him. Now, we ha had a tradition in our town in those days. It's not so much a tradition now. But back in those days, before we got our new McDonald's and our new Hardee's, a lot of the Christians, not all of them, but a lot of them would, would go to the Dairy Queen after church to get ice cream. It was almost a tradition in our town, and the scene was always the same. Whoever had the quick one-hour service at their church got there first, of course. Told their children to behave. The older people went over to the side to visit. And about that time, the next church would begin to arrive, and they'd all speak, of course, to each other. Hi, Bill. How, how was your service tonight? Oh, oh, wonderful. Yours? Oh, uh, yeah, we had a wonderful service, too. I, I've often thought, nobody in my town has a bad church service. <laughs> and guess who walks in right in the middle of all that? Every Sunday night, like clockwork, Norman. <laughs> and you know what we do? Well, sure, you know what we do? The whole place is full of nothing but Christians. I think some of you already know. We ignore him. For some reason, we act like he's not there. I've often wondered why. And I do the same thing. I saw him one particular Sunday night, seated by himself, looking over the top of those thick glasses at the children and at the families while he ate his ice cream all alone. Something seemed to say to me, why don't you go over and spend a moment with Norman and maybe tell him about Jesus? I thought, me? What would somebody think of me if I... Maybe they'll think I'm strange if I... But then I got up uh, as if to buy an ice cream. He was seated near where they sold the ice cream and, and, and I bought a little ice cream and sat down quickly before anybody could see me. I said, Norman, do you remember who I am? I looked, he had terrible dirt in one ear. Those big eyes looked at me and he said, you remember who I am? I thought, oh no. I said, Norman, I'm your neighbor. Now the first people were starting to look. He said, I'm your neighbor. I, said, I know, I know. I said, Norman, listen, listen. I just got a moment. Did you ever think about asking Jesus to come into your heart and be your Savior and your Lord? And he didn't repeat me for the first time ever. Instead, he lowered that ice cream and he looked at me with those great big sad eyes and he said, I've given it serious consideration. And I was shocked. Well, I, I went home. I, I thought, that was something. Well, I'll never have to be involved with him again, I'm sure. And then one day a few weeks later, I saw him out in his yard. And, and it seemed like God was saying to me, Invite Norman over to your house. I thought, inside my house, Norman? Carmel had fixed it up so nice on the inside. Of it. And I knew that night on television there was going to be a great Christian special. And I thought, I know, maybe God wants Norman to see that special. Maybe he wants to witness to him. And so I said, Norman. He looked up. After I'd talked with him in the Dairy Queen, he didn't run away from me as fast as he had before. He, he looked. I said, 
We want to invite you to come over tonight to our house to watch television. 6.30. I didn't know if he'd come or not. He just looked at me and went, oh. 6.30, Norman. We'll, we'll be looking for you. As it began to get dark there in southern Illinois, and the clock was almost 6.30. I looked out the curtain to see if he was coming. A moment later, I went back, and, and I saw him. He was, he was coming across his yard. He'd got all dressed up for us. He didn't take a bath, but he, he put a tie on it. I guess somebody had given him. It hung down like this, kind of funny. And here he come, tall, lanky, maybe around 70 years old, I'd guess, at the time. And he came to our house. I opened the door. I said, well, Norman, come on in. We're glad to have you. Lied. <laughs> see, the problem was I knew with those eyes he may not be able to see well unless he sat close to my 25-inch TV. Color TV. I like color TV. I bought it for Christian programs. <laughs> and sports. And my chair sits near that TV. I love my chair. It was light, gold, soft velvet. I knew if Norman with those clothes on set in my chair, I couldn't hardly get the words out. I said, Norman, why don't you come and... Why don't you... <laughs> sit in my chair. He said, thank you, and I helped him sit down and put the leg rest out on that lazy boy. And, and then we sat back, my wife and I, to watch Norman watch TV. <laughs> it was kind of fun to watch him after an hour or so when the special was over. He, he said, I, 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 guess I'll, I guess I'll go home now. Thank you very much. I helped him out of the chair, walked him over to the door, and opened the door for him and turned the outside light on. I said, Norman, watch the steps. Don't, don't trip and fall down the steps. And he started across my yard. And, so good night, Norman. Maybe I'll have you come back sometime, Norman. Watched him cross the street into his yard, that old dark house where he lived all alone. Found out from a neighbor later that the reason Norman was alone, his father, Norman's father, working in a coal mine, the first day he went to work, the roof fell in on him and killed him when Norman was just a little bitty boy. I told my wife a few days later, I said, I think I'm going to go over and see if he'll allow me to go inside his house. I had no idea what I'd find, and I couldn't believe my eyes when he welcomed me into his house. Hi, right, Norman. Hi. Uh, your neighbor, Mike, crossed the street. You remember? Oh, yeah, I thought I'd come over and see you a minute. I couldn't believe that house. There was dirt everywhere. Dust. When you shook the curtains, dust... <coughs> I couldn't believe the wallpaper that was falling down. Rain had gotten in the ceiling. And wallpaper was falling off the walls. I saw an old tin can with an old big spoon in it. And realized that probably for years Norman had been eating lasagna, spaghetti, and that kind of thing cold out of that can. And then, much to my shock and, and surprise, the Spirit of God suddenly, a few, few days later, said to me, Why don't you take Norman with you somewhere just for fun? I thought, Norman, for, just for fun? I wonder if he ever has any fun, just really does something for fun. And I thought, where would I take him? And then I thought, I know the St. Louis baseball game to see the Cardinals. I saw him out, and Norman, you want to go to the St. Louis baseball game with me? One of these days, I'll get his tickets. He said, okay. I said, all right, I'll pull across the street in a few days. I'll let you know when, and I'll pick you up in the car, and we'll drive almost 100 miles now to, to St. Louis. That day came, I backed my car out of the driveway, pulled over in front of his house, honked the horn, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I got out of the car to see him coming out of his house and across the street. It was hot, baseball weather, very hot time of the year, and here he come out of his house, with a great big long winter itchy tweed overcoat on. <laughs> Went from here almost down to touch his toes. He's so tall and lanky anyway. And where, when he walked across the yard in that old coat, I thought, oh no, he can't wear that coat to the ball game. What if somebody sees me with him? 
What if somebody sees me that knows me? What will people think? So I, I said, Norman, listen, you won't have to wear that coat now. It's hot. You won't need the coat. Leave the coat home, Norman. You won't, you won't need the coat. He said, I, I, I'd kind of like to, kind of like to wear it. I said, Norman, you won't need it now. You, why don't you leave it home, Norman? I, I really, I kind of like, kind of like to wear it. So get in the car, Norman. We got in the car and I turned the air conditioner wide open. And we drove 100 miles to St. Louis. I was looking at him in that old stupid coat. So I started thinking, how can I get him to take that coat off? So I thought up a plan. When we got to the parking lot across the street from the stadium, and he got out of the car and took a first few steps away from the car towards the ball game, I said, Norman, wait a minute. Now listen, I've been thinking about this, and I'm not going to go in that stadium with you if you wear that stupid old coat. Give me the coat, Norman. It'll be safe in the car. I'll lock it up here in the back seat. Nobody will bother it. In fact, Norman, if you don't give... He's... I, I, I kind of do like the kind of... I said, Norman, if you don't give me that coat, I'm going to go home right now. We're not even going to go to the ball game, and I mean it. And I try to look like I'm in it. And reluctantly and slowly, he took the coat off. And he handed it to me, and I put it in the back seat and locked the door on the car and turned around to see him. He had started away from me towards the stadium a few feet and, and all of a sudden I saw why he had that long coat on. He had on two pair of dress pants, one on top of the other of course, and both of them were ripped all the way up the back. I said, Norman, come here, let's put your coat back on you. We put his coat on him, we started in the ball game. When we went through the turnstile, sure enough, the first guy I saw, he didn't know me, but he, he had a big transistor radio under one arm, great big boombox kind of thing, and something to drink in this hand, and he had cut off uh, pants about here, and no sleeves in his shirt, and brill pad hair, and like he was wanting to show muscles, but he didn't have any. And as he walked by, bebopping in the ball game, he looked at Norman and never batted an eye, looked at me and stopped and went, I tell you, we live in a funny world. Norm and I went inside the ball game and sat down. We found our seats and, and we began to watch the game. It started, I said, Norman, look, you like baseball? But Norman, he wasn't looking. He kept looking at the people. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go, get it going. Go, go. All right. He said, ne never seen this many people, one place before, almost 30,000 that day. He said, I, I was only out of our, our little town once in my whole life before this. Went 30 miles one time. I said, well, yeah, there's a lot of people, Norman. Watch the game. The Cardinals, they got a guy on first. He might steal. <laughs> he, could, he wasn't going to watch that. Begin to watch, and all of a sudden a guy came by and said, Hot dogs, hot dogs, get your hot dogs. I said, Oh, Norman, you, you want a hot dog? Have you ever eaten a hot dog at the ball game? For some reason, they're better than anywhere else. You want a hot dog, Norman? He said, Oh, I think I'll try one. A little mustard. He, he ate one and then another one. And a few minutes later, two more. <laughs> and another inning lady, a couple, uh, later, a couple more. I bought him soft drinks, peanuts. Popcorn, nacho cheese, ice cream, everything they sold at the ballpark, except beer, by the third inning we tried it. And you could look around our feet by the third inning, it looked like we'd fed the animals at the zoo. We were just, <laughs> he was still looking for the guy with the hot dogs. I saw him all of a sudden perspiring heavily. I started to reach over and try to make him comfortable and and then an idea hit me. I said, Norman, while you're seated, nobody will know about your pants. Let me help you slip out of that coat. We'll drape it over the seat and you'll be more comfortable. Well, we did. And when I got the coat off of him and just draped it over the seat, he seemed like he was so much more comfortable. I went back to watching the ball game. It was good. It was close. And all of a sudden, everybody stood up like they were leaving. And then I remembered every baseball fan knows there's a seventh inning stretch. And I forgot about Norman's pants. And I said, Norman, 
Let's stand up and stretch like everybody else. It feels good. We begin to stretch. And as I stretched and looked around, the guys right behind us were going. I said, Norman, I think me and you better sit down. I told my wife when I got home, I said, honey, you know, I had a lot of fun with him. I really did. And besides that, I thought, that's what Christians really ought to do, I guess, is reach out to somebody. And so I looked in my closet and I had an old brown suit that I really didn't wear a lot anymore. And I thought, I'm going to give this old brown suit to Norman. Went across the street, kind of held it up extra high. <laughs> Knocked on his door and I said, Norman, I brought you a nice suit. Of course, I didn't tell him I wouldn't wear it anymore, but for Norman, it would be nice. He said, thank you. You want to put it in my closet there? And I opened the door on that old closet and pulled that string and turned the light on as I hung my suit in there. I saw all kinds of old suits, clothes that you wouldn't want, clothes that maybe even the Salvation Army, the Goodwill, wouldn't even want. Over the years, I suppose somebody had brought them to Norman, and I hung my old brown suit in there with all the rest. And that's when something said to me, love your neighbor as yourself. I went home that night and I, I got my Bible and, and I opened it up and it said in Corinthians that if you speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity or love, you're sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. And the next verse said you could have all knowledge and all wisdom, even all faith. And if you didn't have love, you were nothing. And I decided to buy Norman a brand new suit that would cost more than any suit I'd ever bought for myself. I took him downtown to the men's store. He picked the suit out himself. He had good taste. It was dark navy blue, a little tasteful stitching around the edges. And we went home with a new shirt and new underclothes and new socks and new shoes. And I said, Norman, they're having a gospel program, a gospel singing music program down at one of the churches tonight downtown. You want to go and be my guest? You could wear your new suit. He said, I like music. Let's go. I, I said, Norman, if we go, you got to do one thing. What's that? I said, are we pretty good friends by now, Norman? Yeah, yeah, I said, we're pretty good buddies. I said, well, Norman, today is your day. <laughs> said, today? I said, today, Norman, is your day to take a bath. <laughs> he said, it's been a long time since I took a bath. I said, well, Norman, why have, you, why have you not taken baths regularly? And he said something I'll never forget. He said, because I figured who'd care. I said, well, you got to have a bath tonight, Norman, because you don't want to get ring around the collar in that new shirt. I, and I went to the local grocery and bought a bar of lava soap and a big sponge and SOS pads. And I cleaned out his tub, threw all the paper sacks out of there first that he'd been collecting for years. Put the rubber stopper in the bottom of it, turned the hot water faucet on, and it fell in the tub. <laughs> I went across and got some tape, came back and taped it up. It leaked, but it worked. And I said, now here's the plan, Norman. I'm going to go in your living room because I'm not interested in looking at you. And when you're clean, you holler for me and I'll come in and see if you're really clean. I went in the living room and I heard him in there in the tub. Going loop, 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 seemed like he kind of liked it. He said, okay, I'm clean. I heard him and I went in there and I looked at him and I couldn't believe my eyes. It looked like he just smeared mud. I said, Norman, I don't think you got the idea of what I'm talking about here. Norman, I, I, I'm saying you need to be clean. We're talking clean city here, Norman. Give me your head, Norman. He bent over and I got a headlock on him. I didn't hurt him. But I got him where he couldn't get away and I took that lava soap and that sponge and I began to scrub his head. And I heard him going, mmm, mmm, mmm. <laughs> and I looked and all of a sudden a little bit of white was showing through. I scrubbed some more. Mmm, mmm. And I began to realize he had beautiful white hair. I said, put your face up here too, Norman. He went. I scrubbed his face his ears, 
his neck. Then I handed him that sponge and that soap and I said, listen, big boy, from there on down belongs to you. Get it clean. <laughs> I went back in the living room. He said, I'm clean. I came back, pulled the curtain. I said, not good enough, Norman. Went back in the living room. He said, I'm clean. We repeated that process maybe half a dozen times. And finally, when he was finished, he had water all over the floor. He had water all over me. He had water all over the walls. But you could rub your thumb anywhere on his body and he'd squeak. He was so clean. <laughs> I bought him a new toothbrush and toothpaste. He brushed those four teeth over and over and over again. I shaved those whiskers off of him, cleaned his glasses, put them on his face, styled his white hair. He got his new clothes on. I tied his tie and I stepped back to look at the finished product. Product. He, he looked like a state senator, a deacon. We went to the gospel singing. I tell you what I did because I still need to be delivered of a little bit of meanness. I waited on purpose for those folks who come to say, well, we're glad to have you, Brother Mike, for the singing, and who's your friend? I waited on purpose for them to reach over and take his hand, and the moment they took his hand, I'd say, that's Norman. <laughs> I want to tell you how human he is. Right after the a church service. We got in the car. I said, Norman, they've just opened up a new Hardee's on the edge of town. You want to go get a cheeseburger? He said, you think they'll notice my new suit? <laughs> and I laughed and remember thinking, well, God, I know you had me take him to the ball game. But I want to thank you, God, that at least you've never asked me to clean and fix this old house up. I worked for months on that house. <laughs> I scrubbed floors, cleaned appliances, bought most of the white paint in my hometown, painted everything in sight white. Finally, after a few weeks, I stepped back to look and you couldn't hardly even tell I'd been there. I said, God, this is too big. I can't do this. God, it's too big. And we had a blizzard hit our hometown. And the state police made everybody on the interstate turn into our town. And they kept people in basements of churches and, and gymnasiums. And, and some people were kept at the Methodist basement of the Methodist church. And a few nights later, 20 young married Methodists showed up at our door, around 20 or so, with mops and brooms and vacuum cleaners and work clothes and bandanas. And they said, we come to help you clean and fix up Norman's house. I don't even know who told them, but thank God for the Methodist. <laughs> The ladies did uh, cleaning, the men did wiring and plumbing and carpentry work. The, the ladies took the old Venetian blinds to the car wash. They run <laughs> vacuum cleaners. We had a lot of fun fellowshipping together as we cleaned up Norman's house. And when they came back for a second night of cleanup, when we finished that night, I, I sat back and looked and, and I realized what a whole group of Christians could do if they get together. And I knew now that God had done quite a job on me with Norman. And I thought I was through. And breathed sort of a sigh of relief until one day God said to me, while you were remodeling and cleaning this house, did you notice that that one thing over in the corner of the bathroom needs fixing too? I said, I noticed. All that was wrong with it was the lid and the ring were broken. And somebody, I don't have any idea who, had put a brand new lid and ring in a plastic bag with the instructions still inside and leaned it right against his wall in his bathroom. I'm almost afraid to ask who. And I said, God, you're not going to make me fix that in Norman's bathroom, are you? God, I, I sing in churches on the weekend. And they made me a deacon down at the church. And I got a blue pinstripe suit. And I got chair seats at the high school basketball games now. You wouldn't make me repair. I did everything else in here. 
and I wouldn't do it. I wrestled with that. For three days, I wouldn't do it. It was a miserable three days. And I didn't tell my wife about it because I knew what she'd suggest. One night, that third night, we were seated in our living room watching television. She was back in her chair reading the new Sears catalog that had just come in. And I couldn't stand any longer. I just turned around and I said, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> She's lived with me a long time. She just looked at me and went, And I couldn't stand it anymore, so late that night, making sure that all the neighbors were sound asleep, I went in the pantry and got my toolbox. I put my coveralls on, put gloves on my hands. I'd have wore a surgical mask if I could have found one. <laughs> and I slipped across the street late at night, hoping nobody would see me in the dark. Knocked on Norman's door. I said, I'm going to work in your house some more, Norman. He said, okay, Mark, I'll go in the living room. I went in the bathroom, pulled the curtain back, set the toolbox down. I looked at that thing where you push a handle, get clean water. It was so dirty, I thought, I'm not going to touch that thing. Even if I got to work on it, I'm not going to touch it. You know, I see the problem. One of the bolts is broken. The nuts fell off. There's only one left. I got the wrench out of the toolbox to see what size wrench I'd need. Couldn't make it work. I tried another one. Thought, don't touch that thing. <laughs> Finally found a wrench that, no, that's still not right. I almost touched it. I found out something about those things that night. You know, you gotta hug them things to work on them. <laughs> And finally, the only way I could get that nut off that boat, I had to lie down in Norman's floor and crawl up underneath. And finally, I got a wrench on that nut. And it was old rust and dirt, and when I'd move it, it hit me right in the face. And when I finished the job and put the tools away, something very sweet and beautiful said to me, but when you do it under the least of these, you do it unto me. A few days later, I was out in my yard working, minding my own business, and God spoke to me and said, take Norman with you this year on vacation. I said, that's not God. No, that's not God. That's my imagination. See, God, I mean, if that was God, he'd know, because he knows everything, that, that we had planned on going to Opryland in Nashville, Tennessee. God wouldn't have us take Norman to Opryland. A couple weeks later, we're driving the car down to Nashville, my wife and girls sitting in the back seat. Norman sitting over there where my wife usually sits. <laughs> well, as we went in the front of Opryland, I thought, now what could he ride? Because Norman's older and I don't know about his health. Maybe he has a heart problem. Maybe I, I better not put him on that wall bass cannonball. I thought it goes upside down twice. <laughs> and so I picked what I thought he could handle, the bumper cars. I told him how to operate the car. I said, Norman, you'll have to push the pedals turn the wheel and I thought he understood he said he did and we went outside the ride my girls and I and my wife to watch Norman and the ride started and in just a moment he got everybody on the ride caught down at one end of the rink with his car sideways <laughs> had him pinned in with his car and they started getting angry and they were yelling at him and then he was trying to get it going looking at us we were laughing my girl said dad look Norman's, Norman's got everybody caught and suddenly somebody got loose and they came all the way around the open part of the rink and they wanted to hit somebody before the time ran out on the ride so there was Norman sideways so naturally boom they hit his car and when they did he really tried to get it going in and, and one by one they would come around and hit him and, and at first he laughed and we laughed tears were running down our face I couldn't believe it was happening Norm, our woman had up and, and and then all of a sudden I noticed his face he wasn't laughing and and then he looked frightened, and then the next car hit him, and then he looked terrified, and then I saw him trying to get out of the car.
and electricity. I didn't know what could happen. I said, men, stop the ride, but they, they couldn't hear me. And about that time, I think the time ran out because the ride stopped and I hurried in to get him. He was trembling like a little frightened child. And he never complained or said anything, but he looked at me with those eyes. Eyes that seemed to say, I trusted you. And as we walked off that ride, one of the most significant things that ever happened in my life happened to me. I know God said to me, that's what a lot of people have been doing to the Normans of the world all their life. They've been hitting on them. I thought about my Norman, how high school kids had thrown snowballs at him in the wintertime. And everybody laughed when they hit him. Except Norman. I wondered even if I, as a child, had made fun of him. Well, we came home and I thought, well, God, I've learned my lesson. I know you taught me to love my neighbor as myself. And one beautiful Sunday after church, when we came home, I knew that it was Norman's day, not for a physical bath, but for a spiritual bath. And I asked a local pastor who has a lot of love to go with me. And we knocked on Norman's door and he invited us in that Sunday afternoon. And we opened the Bible and we took the book of Romans and we explained to him that even though he was a good person, that even a good person needs to ask Jesus to come into the heart and be their Savior. I tried to explain and read the scripture to him. And first it seemed he was having difficulty understanding. And then all of a sudden, like a light turned on, he said, I, I know what you're saying. He, he says, like, like my windows there, being so dirty, he said, wouldn't do me much good to just clean the outside of them. I'd have to clean the inside too. I said, that's right, Norman, that's right. You're understanding. Jesus wants to come inside and clean you up too. And then he'll help you take care of the outside. I said, Norman, I don't know if you know this, but you need to pray that kind of prayer and let Jesus come into your heart and your life. Because the Bible says every single one of us must confess out of our own mouth and not be ashamed of him that he died at Calvary for our sins. And so we bowed our head and I said, all right, Norman, we're going to wait for you to pray. I held my breath. I really wondered if he'd pray. And after a long moment, I heard him say, Well, God, Mike said I need to ask you to come into my heart. And that's what them preachers used to say on the radio on Sunday morning when my mama listened to him. I looked at him. And he said, and that's what that Bible over there that I've been reading the last few days for myself says. So I want to ask you to come into Norman's heart and be my Savior. Amen. And he looked at me. And he said, did I do okay? I said, you did just fine, Norman. You did just fine. And as I walked across the street, oh, I didn't really see him, but I envisioned some heavenly choir singing and rejoicing because that day Norman came to know Jesus as his personal savior. It's been a long time now since I first helped Norman out there in the yard with his lawnmower that first time. But I've learned that there are Normans out there of every kind. Very wealthy and, and very poor. Normans of all different levels. People living in the shadows. And they need you and me to care about them and to reach out to help them be what they can be. And the reward, the reward is 
Well, Norman, you remember this is the very place when you asked Jesus to come into your heart. Yeah, you remember that day? That's right. I got to tell you, Norman, when I first met you, I was kind of scared of you. I, I didn't really know you, you know. But now that I've known you a while, I hope that when you and I get to heaven, that my next door neighbor is a man called Norman. Hey, got an idea. Let's head over towards the Dairy Queen and get an ice cream. <laughs> Sound like a good idea to you, huh?